Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege of prayer. Thankful that we can come before you at any time and bring our concerns and our cares. But also, Father, we come thanking you for so many blessings that we have in you. Thankful, Father, that you've loved, loved us, you've forgiven us, and you've made it possible for our sins to be cleansed away. Thank you for the life that Jesus lived when he came here to this earth and lived ordinary man and left us an example that we should live. Thankful, Father, that because of his love and your plan that he carried our sins to Calvary, he who was without sin suffered the agony of the cross. Thankful, Father, for that love. And we pray this morning as we remember the sacrifice of Jesus, we'll think seriously about the pain and agony that he experienced here. We thank you, Father, for this congregation of people who meet at Stantonville, for the encouragement we have from one another. We pray that we'll always be a congregation that loves one another and loves the people we come in contact with, that we'll always show Jesus through our lives. We pray, Father, that you bless this congregation as you already have. Ask you to be with our leaders, our elders, our deacons, our ministers, our Bible class teachers, that they may be encouraged during this time. We pray, Father, for those of our community and our family who have lost loved ones, Father, for those who are ill. Pray if it be your will that they might once again be restored to some health, that they might find comfort by being closer to you. Pray to forgive us wherein we fall short, Father. All these things we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the cross.
Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. You all know that prophecy. We all know Isaiah chapter 53. It is one that we look to often when we're thinking about the Lord's Supper, when we're thinking back to the crucifixion. Because it paints a beautiful and vivid picture of not only what happened on the cross to Jesus, but also what that means for us today. But have you ever noticed the language of verse 7? Verse 7 says, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. What does that mean there, that Jesus did not open his mouth, that he opened not his mouth? Does it mean that he, after he was arrested and as he was being crucified, that he never spoke again? No, we know that's not true. We know that he did answer Pilate. We know that when he was on the cross that he called out to God, that he talked to John, that he talked to his mother. We know that Jesus spoke. So what does that mean? The phrase that is used here, the opened his mouth, or in this case, open not his mouth, is a Hebrew idiom that was generally used to refer to the length, freedom, and or type of speech. In this instance, the phrase is describing the fact that Jesus refrained from giving a defense in order to save himself from his sentencing of crucifixion. It wasn't that Jesus literally closed his mouth, that he did not speak again. Instead, it means that Jesus decided not to give a defense for himself. He decided not to to attempt and get himself out of that situation. Why did he do that? Jesus knew that he was innocent. Even Pilate knew that he was innocent. So why did Jesus, though he was innocent, decide not to give a defense for himself? It's because Jesus knew that the ending to the story of the crucifixion would not be the ending to his story. Jesus refrained from giving a defense for himself because he knew the truth that we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Starting at the end of verse 54, it says, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus not only understood the necessity of the cross, the necessity of what it meant for him to be crucified, but he knew that death was not going to win that day. Jesus was silent as a sheep before its shears is silent because he knew that three days later, Satan would be defeated. And it's because of that victory, it's because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ that we are able to have salvation. We are given this special opportunity right now to dwell on that through this communion. And it's my prayer that we see this opportunity for what it truly is. Not just a mundane motion of worship, but as a time of spiritual remembrance used to bring us closer to our Savior, to an understanding of His death, and to an understanding of the victory that He had over His death that day. Let's pray for the bread. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that as we take this bread, as we remember the sacrifice of your Son, that we do so with open hearts. I pray that we realize how blessed we are to be your children. Lord, we're so thankful for the sacrifice of your Son, and we're so thankful uh, that he opened not his mouth. We're thankful that uh, he didn't give a defense for himself, because though he was innocent, his death and his victory over death means salvation for us. 
And it's what gives us the opportunity that we have right now uh, to not only worship you, but to be able uh, to commune together and to remember his sacrifice. And so I pray, Lord, uh, that we don't just see this as a mundane motion of worship, but that we truly take this time to focus on the sacrifice of your son and what that sacrifice truly means to us. We're so thankful for all that you do for us, and we're thankful especially for the sacrifice of your son, Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray, and amen. Let's pray again for the Jews. God, as we come before you again, thinking about remembering the sacrifice of your son, it's my prayer now that we remember that blood that was shed. The blood that is the ultimate atonement for our sins. The blood that gives us our salvation. Lord, we're thankful for that blood because we know uh, that is, as your scripture says, the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. Only the blood of your son can. And Lord, we're thankful again that he opened not his mouth that day. That he allowed his blood to be shed because he knew that that was our only hope. And we're so thankful that you loved us so much to send him to this earth. We're so thankful that Jesus the Son loved us enough to open not his mouth, to allow his blood to be shed that day so that one day we can spend eternity in heaven with you. And we pray right now that as we take this, this fruit of the vine, that we remember that, that we focus on that, and that we realize how blessed we are to be yours. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I know that we, most of us are, are rural dwellers or small town people, so we don't see this that often, but if you've been to the big city recently or really ever before, then you've seen a person like this before. 
Maybe they have a, a heavy blanket or a rough blanket over them. Maybe they have a dog for safety sometimes, maybe a cup. With a little bit of change, they're shaken to ask for a little bit more. But there's also people like this in, in our more rural areas, and maybe they don't look exactly like this. Maybe they're, they're walking down the road or maybe even walking down some rural roads, and you pass by them and, and you know that something's not right. And it kind of is strange to you, and you don't really know what to think, and you've seen where they live, and it just seems uninhabitable. And when we talk about these sorts of people, there are always certain things that we say, too, right? Things like, well, it's his own fault. He's chosen to live that way. Or, well, there are government agencies that, that can help that kind of person. Or maybe we say things like, well, don't give them any money. They'll just go spend it on alcohol. Or, or stay away. You see them, but stay away. They might be dangerous. We have all sorts of ideas and conceptions about these sorts of people. And there are other places in the world where there are entire societies of people who are similar to this, who are in similar situations to this. But there are entire societies like this, right? There are uh, slums, we call them, where people are born into debt and there's really nothing they can do about it and they have very little chance of getting out. And people live like these beggars, but they live in, in places like this, and it's just an awful situation. And though this seems really, really far away in other countries, um, the internet and television makes this seem a little bit closer. Here's my point. We all know Lazarus. He may be really far away. There may not be a whole lot of Lazaruses around us, but we all know, we all know Lazarus. And you may have plenty, or you may feel like you don't have very much, but Lazarus would do anything to trade places with you for a day or two, and most of us would never want to experience the horrible experience of living like a guy like Lazarus or living like this. But Jesus tells a story about Lazarus and people like this in Luke chapter 16. If you have your Bibles, I really want you to go ahead and turn there. Today's going to be a little bit more of a study than usual because there's some kind of heavy stuff and maybe some some preconceived notions that we have about this passage that we've got to wrestle with. So Luke chapter 16, that's where we're at. Jesus tells a story about this poor man named Lazarus. Now, over and over again in the book of Luke, Jesus has talked about money, hasn't he? Maybe even to the point that we've gotten a little tired of it. It's like, good grief, here we go on money and possessions and stewardship again. Just last week, you remember what Jesus said about money in chapter 16, just a few verses before this, verse Verse 13, you cannot serve God and money. Or the very next verse, Luke describes the Pharisees in verse 14 as lovers of money. And we've just seen it over and over and over again in the Gospel of Luke where money becomes a really significant, significant theme. Now here's what I think is going on here. It's like Jesus is, is culminating all of that discussion about money. And he's saying, hey, you, you've, you've heard me talk about money. We've talked about money, but let's get real about money. Because the way you use your money and the way you treat and view those who are poor, this is a heaven and hell issue, right? This is, this is a big deal, and Jesus kind of ups the ante a little bit here at the end of, Act, of Luke chapter 16. Now, again, if you're like me, I kind of grew up um, hearing this story. Not just grew up hearing it, but I've studied it. We all, if you grew up in church and have been in church very long, you know the story of the rich man and Lazarus. And there's this tendency for us to kind of turn to this passage and think, okay, this is the passage that tells us what life after death is like, right? That's how we viewed this passage. But think about context with me. I've been guilty, and I've done it lots of times, where I just pull this story out and talk about it and talk about life after death without any consideration of the context. Who is Jesus talking to here? He's talking, like we, you probably know the answer because we've said it over and over again in the Gospel of Luke. Who's he talking to? He's talking to the Pharisees. He's doing it again. Just back in chapter 16, five verses before this, verse 14, the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all these things, and they ridiculed, and he said to them. So five verses before this, Luke explicitly says Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. You skip back to chapter 15, verse 1 and 2. We talked about the story of the, the prodigal son, the lost coin, the lost the lost sheep, and how Jesus was talking to the Pharisees. Now, he's going to transition back to his disciples in chapter 17. Look at chapter 17, verse 1. And he said to his disciples, so in this passage, who is Jesus talking to? Clearly, the money-loving Pharisees. Which means this story is not a story about what happens immediately after we die. 
That's not the point. Now, are there some things we can learn from it? Yeah, probably so. And we'll talk about those a little bit later on. But that's not what Jesus is going after here. And I've heard the sermon before, probably preached the sermon, one minute after death, what we'll know from this passage. That's not what Jesus was talking about here. The point of this story is money, not life after death. And if we're going to understand it correctly, we've got to understand the context, and you know that. So here's the problem with this story, and I've already hinted at it. If you've been around church very long, um, we know this story well. And I think because of that, we've kind of got some misconceptions. And, and I did too. I, I want you to know that I, I've really wrestled with this passage. And it's changed my mind on a couple things as I've really studied it in its context. So there are some things that we've got to wrestle with. Now, here's the deal. In a lot of churches, I wouldn't do this. We just skip this part. I may hint at it. But you guys are biblically literate, and you care about studying the Bible, so I want to I hit on this, all right? So I hope you're there. Let's think deep for just a minute before we read this passage. Here are three questions that I think we've got to ask and wrestle with in relation to this passage. Number one, is this a parable? Is this a parable? There have been some, especially in churches of Christ, who have vehemently argued, no, it is not a parable. You know why? Because it uses a name. Lazarus's name is there, and no, in no other parable does Jesus use a name. Now, here's why this is important and why it's important to think about this. I'm afraid that the reason we argue that it's not a parable is because we're scared that if it's a parable, we can't take all of the stuff, all of the information literally. We can't make exact parallels about the afterlife from this story if it's a parable. Here's the problem, though. It reads like a parable, and it sounds like a parable. And you know what they say? Actually, I don't know how the saying goes. If it walks like a dog and talks, is that how it goes? Or something like that. If it sounds like a parable and looks like a parable and reads like a parable, probably a parable. But people say, wait a second, but Lazarus' name, he doesn't, it's got to be a real person. Well, let's come back to that in a second. Here's what I want you to know. Six times in the Gospel of Luke, it starts off a parable with these words. There was a certain man. Now, there are three of those times, if you were looking at Greek, it'd be like the exact same language. Three of those times, it adds a, an adjective. Chapter 16, verse 1, there was a certain rich man. Chapter 16, verse 19, there was a certain rich man. In chapter 19, there was a certain nobleman. And in English, we take out the word certain, but it's the exact same structure six different times. As if Luke is trying to say, here's how Jesus started a parable. You can, you can read these words and know this is a parable. In fact, right here in chapter 16, look at verse 1. There was a rich man. And then he goes on to tell, tell a parable. Just a few verses later, verse 19, how's he start this parable? Or this story, I don't want to give it away yet. There was a rich man. Over and over again, Luke begins parables or tells the story of Jesus telling these parables in the exact same way because it's as if he wants his readers to know this is a parable. This is a parable. And so here's my conclusion after wrestling with this this week, and I really hadn't wrestled with it before, but to be honest, it sounds like a parable and begins like a parable. And so I think this is a parable. Now, again, some folks would say, well, why in the world does he give Lazarus a name? He doesn't do that in parables. Let me give you a couple of potential options. So one option is to show that the rich man really knew him. This isn't just some random guy in the street that the rich man walked by a couple of times. Like this was right outside the rich man's house. He knew his name and he still didn't help him. And the second reason that Jesus may have given Lazarus a name is because of the meaning of his name. Lazarus literally means helped by God. And in this story, who gets helped? The last person that any good Jew would have thought God would help. A beggar like this. You see, in Jewish culture, God was connected to the wealthy people. Somebody like this, man, he doesn't have any connection to God. And so when Jesus tells the story and gives this guy the name Lazarus, helped by God, immediately that would have had an impact on the people that Jesus was talking to. So, change my mind on this this week. I think this is a parable. I think there's enough evidence to, to show that it is. Secondly, then... Is everything in this a literal description of the afterlife? Well, let me tell you what, we just, what I just said. If it's a parable, then I think we need to be very careful about taking every detail literally. Because, again, this is one of those stories, and you've done it, I've done it. I've used this as proof of certain things about the afterlife. Little details, all of this must be a description of exactly what it's like after we die. If this is a parable 
then we need to be careful about that because parables are often meant to represent things so that Jesus could prove a point or show something to be true. And a lot of that has to do with with money in this passage. Now, there are some true things about the afterlife that I think we can learn from this, but we need to be careful. But let me give you a couple of examples of things that I don't think are literal because it's pretty obvious they're not literal. In this story, we're going to see in a minute that somebody in eternal torment, and you can decide what you want to call that place a little bit later on, Eternal torment speaks to someone in eternal comfort. Where else does that happen in Scripture? Nowhere else. Nowhere. And think about it practically. Is that something that we want to pull from this passage and say, yeah, based on this passage, people in eternal torment can speak to those people in eternal comfort and back and forth? Well, no, that's nowhere else in Scripture. That's not meant to be literal. That's meant for Jesus to say, prove the point that the afterlife, you can't get out of it. Once you're there, it's, it lasts forever. There's no crossing over from one side to another. Let me give you another example of something that I don't think is literal, that maybe sometimes we have taken as literal. In verse 26, Abraham says, and besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed. Your older translations say a great gulf has been fixed. I have a chart that I show in my Life of Christ class, and I've shown here at some point, I'm sure, that shows what eternity is like, and it's got death, and then there's, I've got this circle, and on one side is, is Hades, and the other side is paradise, and then I've got this area in between them, and I put the great gulf. If this is a spiritual place, is there really like, like the grand canyon between the two of these? Or is Jesus trying to describe this figurative reality that, There's no crossing over between the two. Is there actually some great gulf or chasm between the two places? Well, no, that's not meant to be literal. And so here's, again, my point. There's some things we can learn about this, but if it's a parable, then we need to be careful about taking every detail literally. Now, here's the third question, and this is more of a cultural one. How could a loving Jesus talk about a place of eternal torment? Isn't that something that people in our culture are going to ask? If Jesus is all loving and completely full of the truth and he's full of mercy and compassion, how could he talk about such a a place of torment for a place, a person like, like the rich man? Well, let me put my answer on the screen and it's a little bit longer, but I think it's best to throw it all up on the screen. If he is the most loving, humble, compassionate, truth telling person ever, and he talks about hell, you know what that means? It means that our sin must be way more serious than we could ever imagine for him to talk so seriously about it. If Jesus really is the most loving, compassionate, truth-telling person ever, that he talks about hell, ought to show me just how serious my sin is. Paul says in Romans 11, verse 22, note the kindness and severity of God. And we love to talk about the kindness of God. And maybe for some of you from an older generation, you remember a time where you feel like, man, all we talked about was was the severity of God. And maybe we swung to the other side and and in reaction to that, we said, well, we need to talk about the grace of God. And, And Paul says, listen, we've got to talk about both. And that doesn't fit well in our culture. We'd rather talk about the kindness and the love of God, and rightly so. And it seems unloving to warn people, doesn't it? To talk about the negative and the severity of God. But we, we warn people all the time, and it's the loving thing to do, isn't it? Like, when, when we're camping and our, our kids are out on their bikes, I will warn them repeatedly, you have to watch what you're doing. There are big trucks, campers rolling through here, and I know it's quiet most of the time, but you've got to listen and you've got to watch, and you've got to watch out for each other. And I can get a little straight with them, kind of harsh with them if I don't think they're doing it very well. And somebody will say, well, that's kind of unloving. no. It would be unloving not to warn my kids about dangerous things, wouldn't it? And if Jesus warns us about this, then it's the, it's the loving thing to do. How could, he, how could he not? It's the loving thing to warn people about the dangers of the future. So here's the deal. Even though this is hard, we talk about hell because we trust Jesus. And Jesus talked about it. Now, happy Father's Day. Let's talk about hell. I'm just kidding, Um, but not really. I'm not kidding. We are going to talk about hell. Here's the deal. This is one of those places where I would say, all right, we're walking through Scripture no matter what, even in places where it might be a little more difficult. This isn't the best passage for Father's Day. I get that. But I've said all along, say it often on these sorts of days, I'm going to trust that God is going to give us what we need when we need it, and I'm going to trust the Holy Spirit to work 
in, through the word in ways that we need it when we need it. But, again, this isn't the best day. Here's the thing. You might say, well, man, this doesn't have anything to do with fathers. Um, I think this passage actually has some things for, for fathers and men that we need to be reminded of and ways that we need to lead in, especially if we understand that this passage is more about money than it is about heaven and hell. So let's dive in. We're going to read the passage together, explore it for a minute, and then talk about what in the world we can learn about it if I've just messed the whole thing up by saying it's not all about literal afterlife. Anyway, what can we learn? Here we go. We're in chapter 16 of Luke, verse 19. Now watch the contrast between two guys here, right? There was a rich man who was clothed in purple. It's what the rich people wore. These are the best clothes. And fine linen. I'll give you a little inside note here. Fine linen is probably a, a, point, or a point out that he had really, really nice underwear. All right? Probably from Egypt. I know that's weird, but that's probably what's going on here. He had fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. I don't know if any of you have ever been on a cruise before or maybe at some hotel with a big buffet. Danny and Dad, you remember some of those hotels in Israel and the massive buffets? Man, you feast sumptuously. This guy had his own personal chef and massive buffet every single day. Now, you might walk away from this and think, well, is it wrong to feast sumptuously? No, occasionally. Some of you are probably going to feast sumptuously today. Back in chapter 15, what did the, the dad do when his son came home? They threw a party. I think they feasted sumptuously. But here's a guy who did it every single day, every single meal, without a notice of the beggar who stood outside or sat outside his house. And that's who we read about in verse 20. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores. So he was in poverty. He was sick. He was covered with sores. And he was starving. Verse 21, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. There's some evidence historically that wealthy people used bread as napkins. And they would wipe their hands, wipe their faces with the bread, and then throw it out. Maybe that's what he's looking for. But he's, he's so hungry, he'd just take the scraps from the table. But add injury to insult, or insult to injury, whichever way it goes. I should stop using sayings, shouldn't I? Verse, rest of verse 21. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. So cute little, cute little dog comes, no. See, dogs, for Jews, they weren't man's best friend. They were not cute. They were not liked very well. Some people had pets, but most people did not. And so these were the street dogs that were dirty and filthy and that everybody hated and that were dangerous. And they came and pestered this guy in his misery. So you've got two complete opposites. Here's the rich man up here. Here's the poor man down here. But then the great equalizer comes, and all of a sudden they're on the same level. Verse 22 the poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. Notice that he was not buried. The rich man was buried. We don't know if the dogs ate this guy. We don't know. But the angels carry him. The text says to Abraham's side. Now, some older translations say, say Abraham's bosom. Now, that sounds like a place, doesn't it? We've kind of talked about like Ab- you've got Hades and Abraham's bosom. You know what Abraham's bosom is? You know what that means that he was at Abraham's side? He was sitting by him at the great feast. All right, that's all. It's not a place. It's just a, it's a place of honor is what it is. All of the, here's, Lazarus is with all of the Jews, faithful Jews of times before. And how much of a good spot does he have? He's seated by Abraham himself, the father of the Jews. He's at Abraham's side in this place of comfort. Now we need to be careful saying, okay, here's exactly where that is and what that is. The text doesn't give us all that information, so let's pause there and just say, he's with Abraham, and he's the last person that anybody would have imagined would be sitting right beside Abraham in eternal comfort. But on the other side, in this great reversal, is the rich man. Rest of verse 22, the rich man also died. He was buried, unlike Lazarus, and in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. Now again, it's a parable. We need to be careful about making precise statements about where this is and what this is. But he's in, a, he's in torment. Now the text says Hades. But as you read the rest of this, it sounds a lot like the place that Jesus describes with, as Gehenna or hell. Again, let's just not be too precise about it. It's a parable. Don't know exactly where he's at except to say this is torment. This is, a, this is punishment. And he called out, verse 24, Father Abraham, 
You know what he's doing there, right? He's appealing to his heritage, right? He's saying, hey, I'm one of your guys, Abraham. I'm a Jew. Can, can you help me here? I think this is an important, he doesn't get helped. And I think it's a reminder that your heritage, who your parents are, how long you've been in church, how much you go to church is not the reason that you're in a right relationship with God. You're in a right relationship with God because of Jesus Christ and what he's done on the cross. And so this man appeals to his heritage as if that's going to get him into good favor with Abraham. And he pleads with him, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. Wherever he's at exactly, it's a place of torment. And it is bad. And notice that the guy who didn't show any mercy while he was on earth is the guy who's begging for mercy here. It's a bit ironic. Now again, we don't know exactly what this place is and what it's like. And some people sometimes ask, are the descriptions of hell in Scripture literal? Is it a place of literal fire? Or is it a place of, in Jude, he calls it a place of utter darkness? Well, that's interesting because those two things can't coexist, can they? Utter darkness and, and fire. I th I'm convinced that a lot of what the afterlife, or the ways the afterlife is described, are described in ways that we can understand because we're human beings and the reality is, hell is going to be a lot worse than we can imagine, and eternal life with Jesus is going to be a lot better than we can ever imagine. And the Bible describes it in ways that make it sound horrible or great, depending on what you're talking about. The reality is, maybe some of this isn't meant to be literal. Maybe it is. It's difficult to know. So here's what happens next. We keep reading. Here's Abraham's response. It's verse 25. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things, and now he's comforted here, and you're in anguish. In other words, here's this great reversal. The rich man was up here, Lazarus was down here, and now those, those states or those conditions have been reversed. Verse 26, and besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. In other words, there's no crossing between the two places. You can't, Lazarus can't go over to you and you can't come over here. There's no, there's no reverse in this. Verse 27, and he said, well, let me, let me beg something else. If, if I can't cross over, if you can't send Lazarus, will you do something for me, Abraham? Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Apparently, Lazarus, or the rich man understands where he's at and why he's there, because he says, my brothers are headed for the same destination as me. Can you send Lazarus back? Notice how he's kind of treating Lazarus as just this, this messenger, still kind of looking down on him. Send Lazarus to warn my brothers. He's still not concerned about anybody else but his own people, just his own family, not concerned about anybody else. So he asks to send back Lazarus to warn his brothers. And here's Abraham's response. And this is important in the context of the verse, or the passage. Remember, he's talking to the Pharisees. And what's he say to, to, this, to the rich man? But Abraham said, verse 29, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. In other words, just like the Pharisees, they have the law, they have the word of God in front of them, they have access to it, they've heard it hundreds and hundreds of times, and they know what it says about how to treat the poor, and they still ignore it. Listen to the word, he says. That's what they should do. You didn't do it. Can you imagine how much that must have stung the Pharisees but he points them to the very law that they, that they were so careful and meticulous about obeying, and yet they missed the heart of the law. Verse 30, and he said, no, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. They need something new. They need, they need a dead person coming back from the dead. Now, Abraham's going to say, that's not going to work either, but this is a reminder here as well, that if you're always looking for something new, to satisfy your spiritual longings. Always a, a new idea or a new book or a new speaker or a new this, a new this, 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 or this. If you're always looking for something new, perhaps it's the case that you're missing out on the real solution, and that's Jesus. And if Jesus is not what you're searching for as you search for something new, you are always going to be left unsatisfied. Always. Always. And here's Abraham's response, verse 31. He said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. You think he had in mind maybe 
what would happen. Luke's writing this years later, but Jesus knew that he, when he raised Lazarus from the dead, some believed, and a lot of people just went mad and went to the Pharisees. In the book of Acts, when the resurrection was preached, and, and they talked about somebody coming back from the dead, what was the response? Well, some believed, and a lot of people just got really angry about it. So, here's the question. We've read the story. What in the world do we learn from this story? Like, what's, what was Jesus intending to do here? Let me give you three or four things that I think we can walk out of here this morning having grown from, from this story. And it's not necessarily what we usually talk about when we come to this story. Number one, Jesus wants us to see the great reversal of the way we see things in the world. Over and over again in Luke Jesus focuses on, and you see God's love for the outsider, for the tax collector, for the sinner, for the poor, for the sick, for the prodigal son, for women and children who in that culture were looked down upon. Over and over again, Jesus is focused on the outsiders, a reversal of the way that we normally see things. Go back to Luke chapter 6. We talked about this not quite a year ago, but probably pretty close. In Luke chapter 6... Jesus, I think this story that we've just read is a, a, an illustration of what he's just described in Luke 6, starting in verse 20. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry, now you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you. And then you skip to verse 24, watch this. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. You see, over and over again in Luke, Jesus shows us the great reversal that God sees things differently, sometimes the exact opposite of the way that we see things. And isn't that an important reminder because it's really easy to focus on all the physical stuff. And it's easy to kind of put a Band-Aid on, on the, the reality that we're all going to die by consuming things and compiling things in our world and in our life. And the reality is, what often matters to us is the opposite of what matters to God. And often the people that we pay the most attention to are opposite of the people that Jesus paid the most attention to in the Gospel of Luke. Here's the second thing, I think, maybe the most important thing we learn from this passage in its context. Followers of Jesus are expected to share their wealth with others. Period. Followers of Jesus are called to show compassion to the poor and to share with the poor. This text does not tell us what condemned this man. Let that sink in except for the fact that he didn't care for the poor man who was at his gate. That's it. So this is a heaven and hell Jesus, or heaven and hell issue. Now here's the, the problem. We're tempted to read passages like this and think, oh, well that means if I'm going to go to heaven, I have to help the poor. Like that's, that's what saves me. No, you are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. But this text and others does indicate, I think, that we can be lost for not helping the poor. So maybe a question that we ought to ask ourselves is this one. Who are our Lazaruses, and where are they? And I don't really know the answer to this question, but perhaps for each of us the answer is different. Who are the Lazaruses in my life? Who are the ones that, that perhaps I, they're there every day, or they're around me on a regular basis, but I ignore them. I don't pay any attention to them. And this story pushes me to change my perspective on that. And here's where I want to talk to, to men for a second. Guys, in, in our culture, we're kind of called, especially our more southern culture, we're called to be tough and rough, and sometimes that means not showing much compassion. We look at people in need, and we, we're, we're just going to, be, we're going to be really manly about it, be like, well, yeah, if they, if they would do this, and I'm not going to show any compassion, it's their own fault. Pull yourself up by their bootstraps. They need to do that. What's their problem? And maybe this passage is a call to simply be like Jesus and not like our culture and show compassion on those who are in difficult positions and difficult spots in life. And maybe one of the best ways that we can show our families Jesus is by showing compassion to the poor. And maybe one of the best ways that we can show our families how strong we are 
is by our humble submission to the Father and imitating him by showing compassion to those who are poor. This isn't, a, this isn't up in the air as to whether or not this is required of us. These, Luke is clear. Jesus is clear. We're expected to share our wealth with others, especially the poor. And then from this passage and the fact that he's talking to Pharisees, we can't miss this. We have to hear, know, and obey the word. It's entirely possible to hear the word and know the word just like the Pharisees but never put it into practice. And let me add, it's possible to hear, know, and obey most of the word. The Pharisees were known for being excellent obeyers of the law. In fact, they had a, whole, a list of other additional laws, traditions of men, Jesus would call them, that helped them obey the law. But they missed out on what was most important. Their hearts hadn't changed. It's entirely possible to come to church, to go through the motions, to obey in so many ways and not allow God to change your heart. We have to know hear and obey the word and change our hearts. And then last, I think it's important to note that there are some things we can learn about the afterlife here. So have your Bibles open for just a second. Let me, let me wrap up with this. As I said, I've kind of had my mind, my mind changed on this, all right? And I, I questioned whether to even talk about this. I thought it'd be better in a second class, but let me talk about this real quick. I think from this story, we have historically, I have historically, historically, recently, I have, I've said, okay, there must be this waiting place, people call, I read this week, they call it a receptacle, it's such a weird name, a waiting place where there's, there's torment and there's paradise and then we die, or resurrection and then heaven and hell. And I, I've got, again, I've got the chart, I'm going to delete it from my Life of Christ class this fall or redo it because this, I've changed my mind about this, I'm just being honest with you. And here, here's why. Number one, this is a parable, but I think there are, there's more evidence in the New Testament that when we die, we go to be with the Lord. We talk like that too, don't we? Well, they're with the Lord now. Well, where's the Lord? He's at the right hand of the Father. Where's the Father? In some separate place from heaven, some random waiting place we call paradise? Well, no. You know what Paul says. Turn to Philippians 1, real quick. Philippians 1. Here's how Paul describes his desire to to live but also to die, starting in verse 21. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. Now watch this. I am hard pressed between the two. My, my desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. If you skip over to 2 Timothy chapter 4, he knows he's going to die soon. And in verse 18, he says, okay, I'm about to die, but the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. Does that sound like some waiting place called paradise? No. Paul believed he was going to be in heaven with Jesus after he died. And where's Jesus? You remember in Acts chapter 7, Stephen is being stoned. In fact, you should read it for yourself. Acts chapter 7, Stephen's being stoned. He is dying. And in verse 50, 55, watch what happens. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And then in the next verse, he describes what he's just seen. Where's Jesus? Well, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. And where's the Father? The Father is always described as being in heaven. Now, here's my point. We need to be careful about describing what happens after we die with certainty. When there are verses here that don't seem to, to match, they don't contradict but there appears to be plenty of evidence that perhaps when we die, there's not this waiting place, but we go to heaven, and then after the resurrection, we see the full glory of it. Again, I don't know what all that looks like. I'm just asking us to not, be, not speak with such certainty about things that maybe the Bible isn't as clear about. I've done it in the past. I've spoken with certainty and shown the charts, and I'm not convinced I should have done that. But there are some things we can learn from it. All right, here you go, real fast. Number one, there is life after death for both the righteous and the unrighteous, according to this passage, right? That's pretty clear. The afterlife provides an opportunity for the injustices of life on earth to be corrected. Yeah, it's pretty clear, this reversal that occurs here. There is a clear and unbridgeable divide between eternal life and eternal death. I don't think it looks like the Grand Canyon, but there is, there's a divide. You can't cross from one side to the other. This passage clearly indicates that. There's no second chance for salvation after death. The rich man wanted it. 
But Abraham was clear. You had your chance. You had the law and the prophets. And then last, judgment is based on our response to God's will as set out in the scriptures. As Abraham says, you got to listen to the law and the prophets. Now, in light of all this, how should we respond? Here's the first thing we should do. This, ought, this story ought to produce all love and respect for God for rescuing us from what we deserved. If you understand how this place that the rich man is in, how it is described, and that we've been rescued from that, wow, it ought to move us to awe and love and worship and a passion to follow him with all of our hearts. See, hell doesn't motivate people to, to love God. The cross does. And the cross is God's solution to our sin and our deserving, being deserving of hell. But here's our second response, and we'll wrap up with this. As we read this and read how awful this place that the rich man is in, it ought to produce in us a compassion for the lost who will face a Christless eternity. I've told you before, and I've put numbers on the screen that, that show that about one-third of the world's population claim to be Christians of some sort. And about one-third of the world's population has never heard the gospel. They don't know about They may have heard the name Jesus, but they don't know anything about him. So, with that in mind, think about death rates in our world. And these, are, these have changed just a, a tad with everything that's going on. But in general, normally, the death rates in our world look something like this. Every day, 150,000 people die. Population is about 7.8 billion. So 150,000 people die every day. That comes out to about 6,300 people every hour and 105 people every minute. All right, that's kind of sad. This, but these are just the statistics that... Um, that exists in our world, this is according to the Ecology Global Network. Let's think about the number of people who are saved or lost. Let's just say, to give us an easy number to work with, that God saves 20% of the people. Now, I know what the Bible says, and it's probably less than that, but let's just say that God's grace is way bigger than we can ever imagine, and it is bigger than we can imagine, and God saves 20% of the people who die, just for, just for sake of discussion. God saves 20% of the people who die in our world. That still means every day, 120,000 people die and enter into a Christless eternity. 50,000 of those have never heard the good news about Jesus Christ. Every minute, 80 people pass from this life into a Christless eternity. 35 of them have never heard the good news of Jesus Christ. In the 30 minutes or so, we may be beyond that now, since I started this sermon, 2,400 people, since I started, just like you and me, have passed from this life into a Christless eternity. In those 10 painfully awkward seconds, 13 people passed from this world into a Christless eternity. And six of them never heard the good news of Jesus. That's why we ought to have compassion on the lost. And that's why we ought to praise the Father in heaven who gave Jesus Christ so that we wouldn't have to face that.
thank you for worshiping with us today. Um, pretty soon, I hope there's a time when we're all together. But for the ones that feel necessary to stay at home or the elderly, we appreciate that. And, and we're happy to bring you this worship service. Um, the elders wanted me to talk about something today. Um, Brandy and I just came back <laughs> from our uh, honeymoon. And a lot of times when you go on a vacation, you go to see God's beauty. I, my, I've got an aunt right now that's at the Grand Canyon. We were in the Great Smoky Mountains. They're beautiful, beautiful. But today I want to look at something else that God made that was beautiful. And that's you and I. His greatest creation is not the earth, even though it is most wonderful. It's you and I. And if you if you think that it's not, this lake is beautiful. I mean, it really is. But tell me, it pales in comparison to the, the smile and the laughter of a child. Where have you ever been around your grandparents and see the wrinkles in their hands and, and hear them laugh? See the wrinkles in their hands, which are from wisdom and years of toil and work. How wonderfully they're made and how wonderful we are. Each and one of us are different. God knows each one of us personally. He knows the number of hairs on your head. How wonderful that is. Yes, this earth is beautiful. But how much more beautiful are you and I? It tells us that when a sparrow falls, God even knows that. So how much more does he know you and I? I hope y'all have a wonderful Sunday afternoon.